The divine institution of marriage is in serious trouble today. How many would agree to that? Amen. It's in real big trouble. I was looking over some statistics, and I went back to 1867. And in 1867, the divorce rate was 3%. There was 33 marriages for every divorce. And then I fast forwarded to the year 1900. And that year, the divorce rate was 7%. 14 marriages for every one divorce. Fast forward to 1975. You've got two marriages for every divorce. So it's gone from 3% in 1867 to 7% in 1900 to 50% in 1975. And from 1975 on, it's pretty much stayed about the same. Interestingly, in 1982, that was our high water mark for marriages within the United States. So ever since that time, we have slowly been decreasing in the amount of marriages that are in the United States. And that's interesting because the population has just been climbing ever since then. We have more and more people in the United States, but less and less marriages. So what's happening? People are just living together anymore. They, what's, what's, why should we get married? What's the use? Let's just move in together. And that's happening more and more and more. And so the sacred institution of marriage has fallen upon really hard times here in the United States. Our, our culture as a whole doesn't value marriage. We don't lift it up to the place that God does. And so does the Bible have anything to say about marriage? It has a whole lot to say. And in fact, in Genesis chapter 2, we're going to go back to the book of beginnings and see the very first marriage, and there's a whole lot that God's going to unpack for us in this passage. Not only is the divorce rate climbing higher and higher, not only are more and more people just not even living together, or not being married, but living together, but today, we have sort of this downhill slide into what seems inevitable. There's this trajectory where we are probably going to legalize same-sex marriages here in the United States. A lot of people think it's just a foregone conclusion. It's just a matter of time until a man can marry a man legally or a woman can marry a woman legally in the United States. Does the Bible have anything to say about that? Yes. It sure does and not in an approving way. The, the Bible doesn't, have, doesn't recognize anything at all about a man marrying a man, as we're going to see as we get into the Word of God. So let's look at Je, uh, Genesis chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 18 to 25, but before we jump into that passage, let me give you just a quick overview of what's happening in chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 1, what we have is God's account of the creation of the world. In Genesis chapter 2, God takes his zoom lens, puts it on his camera, and zooms in on one particular day out of those six days described in chapter 1. We have Genesis, we have day 6 uh, zoomed in, and all the details of that day are brought before us here in chapter 2. And a lot of times we think the Bible was written chronologically. So, Genesis chapter 2 happened after Genesis chapter 1, but that's not true. Genesis chapter 2 happened at the very same time that Genesis 1 verses 26 to 31 were taking place. It's just an amplification. It's like, if you ever gone on Google Maps and you can click the plus and you zoom in and you keep zooming in and zooming in? That's what's happening in chapter 2. We're zooming in on day 6 to see the details surrounding the creation of man and woman. Now, as we work our way through this passage, we're going to see three things about Adam. First, Adam alone, and then Adam asleep, and then Adam elated. So first of all, Adam alone, verses 18 to 20. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I'll make him a helper suitable for him. Now, I want you to focus in on that first phrase. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. This is a jarring statement because we've had several statements in chapter 1 where God has always said that it was good. Look back with me to chapter 1, verse 12. No, back, verse 10 actually. Verse 10 says, God called the dry land earth and the gathering of the waters he called seas and God saw that it was good. Or verse 12, and the earth brought forth vegetation 
plants yielding seed after their kind, and trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind. And God saw that it was good. Or verse 18. And God made... I'll, I'll start in verse 17. And God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, and to govern the day and the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. Or verse 21. God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarmed after their kind and every winged bird after its kind. And God saw that it was good. And over and over and over again, after God does something, he sees that it's good. But here in chapter 2, verse 18, God saw that it was not good. Now here we have a perfect creation and we have a sinless man and we have him in fellowship with a perfect God, what could be wrong about that? What could be not good about that situation? Well, it's not good for the man to be alone. Now, we're not talking about it being morally evil. It's not morally evil for the man to be alone. What he's saying is that man was incomplete. It wasn't good for him not to have a companion or a mate to share his life with. And so God said, I'll remedy that situation. I'm going to make him a helper suitable for him. Notice the second part of verse 18. I will make him a helper. I'll make him a helper. You see, God had already made man back in chapter 2, verse 7. There the Bible says, The Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Some things God just made out of nothing. Right? But when it comes to man, he uses some pre-existing materials. What is it? Dirt. Dirt. <laughs> Dust. Ground. Earth. That ought to humble us, shouldn't it? We're just, we're just jars of dirt, jars of clay that God has somehow given life to. So God takes the dirt... He, he fashions it together into the body of a man, and that, that body was lifeless. It was inert. Until God breathed into the nostrils of that man the very breath of life, and that man came alive. His heart started ticking. His brain started registering brain waves. His, he, his respiratory system kicked into action, and he started to breathe, and he became a living being. So that's how man was made. What we find in here in chapter 2 is that woman was made in a completely different way than man was made. In verses 18 to 25, God describes the creation of the woman. Now, here's my question. Why didn't God make man and woman at the very same time out of the dirt? You know, just take the dirt and make one lump into a man and one lump into a woman. Why didn't he do that? I believe the reason is because God had planned that the man and the woman were going to share different roles. He had a different job for each one of them to do. And by delaying the woman's creation for a little while, God could set in motion some principles that would demonstrate for all time that yes, man and woman are equal, but he has complementary roles that he has assigned to each one. Now, to know that they're equal doesn't take a lot, because if you just go back to Genesis 1 and look at verse uh, 26, the Bible says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them, so that's talking about man and woman now, let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man in his own image. In, in, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So man and woman are both created in the image of God. They're equal. Man and woman are both given the mandate to rule over God's creation, to exercise his dominion in the earth. They are equal when it comes to this uh, playing field. But there are differences you guys ever notice there are some differences between man and woman? It's not just biological and physical. There's a lot of other differences that go into the two different sexes. To, to, to demonstrate 
that God has a different plan and a different role for the man, that, and that's different from the woman's role. God creates the man first, and then what does God tell the man in verse 16 and 17? Do you remember? He gives him a very specific command. Don't eat. That's right. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, was Adam there when God gave... I'm, I'm sorry, was Eve there when God gave Adam that command? No. No. She wasn't created yet. God gave Adam the command. After he gave Adam the command, he made the woman. We have no record in the Bible that God ever spoke that command to the woman. Who was responsible then to take the information about that very special command and give it to the woman? Adam. Adam was. Adam was called to be the leader in the relationship. He needed to communicate God's moral standards to his wife and then help her, lead her into obedience. Well, of course, we know he failed miserably in that. And... That's probably why in Romans 5 it says that the man was the one that plunged the world into sin and death, even though it was the woman who ate from the forbidden fruit first. So God creates the man first. He gives him a job assignment, and that is to communicate God's word to the woman and then to lead her into righteousness. Well, we know that doesn't happen. So there's different roles, even though there is an equality. And that shouldn't surprise us, should it, when we look at the God who made us. Our God is one God, <coughs> manifesting three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, is the Father superior to the Son? No. The Father and the Son and the Spirit are all equally divine, right? They're all God. <coughs> but they're different persons. Does the Father have the same role as the Son? The Father is the one who established the plan. The Son comes and redeems those God has planned. And then the Spirit comes and applies the redemption of Christ to the lives of those the Father has planned. So there's different assigning of roles within the work of redemption. Sometimes we think of that word helper and we think, well, that's just a really demeaning word. Women, have you ever thought that? that it makes me feel a little bad. I mean, I'm only a helper? Don't I get to be the, the leader? Well, you're the helper. <laughs> but you, that shouldn't make you feel bad as though it's some kind of a, a groveling, sniveling doormat for the man because God himself, throughout the Old Testament, identifies himself as the one who brings help to Israel. God is the helper of his people. And the Holy Spirit is the helper of the church. So, Adam's created first, then the woman is created. Back to uh, Genesis chapter 2, another principle we see there is that Eve was created to help the man. And if you look with me at 1 Corinthians 11, Paul picks up on this principle and he evidently believes that there's something very important about that as well. So 1 Corinthians 11 verse 8, For man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. For indeed man was not created for the woman's sake, but woman for the man's sake. I hope you women, the, the, the hackles don't start rising when you read that verse. But it does say, a woman was created for the man's sake. In other words, she was created to benefit and to support the man, to carry out the role God had given him. Man couldn't do it alone. He needed someone who was his counterpart to assist him in doing this particular work. So God creates man first. He creates the woman to support him. And the third thing we notice about this is that God creates man to be the head in the relationship. In other words, to have authority in this relationship. And we know that because God gives man the responsibility to name the woman. We see that happening twice here. In verse 23, Adam says, She shall be called woman. Or in chapter 3, verse 20, it says, now the man called his wife's name Eve. The person who has authority is the one who names the other individual. It happens throughout scripture. Jesus Christ himself names Simon Peter. God changes the name of Abram to Abraham. Parents are the ones that give names to their children. The children don't 
give a name to their parents. Masters will oftentimes give names to servants. So the one in authority is the one who has the right to give a name to that individual. God has established the fact that Adam was given the role of headship in the relationship by giving him the privilege of giving his wife her name. So those are the three principles we see, and we see this happening before sin enters the world. Okay, this isn't, these principles don't derive from sin, they come before sin even enters the world. Notice the next word here in verse 18, I'll make him a helper suitable for him. I love that word. It means corresponding to him. And it's the idea of two pieces of a jigsaw puzzle coming together and fitting completely. <coughs> Okay, so the woman comes and she fits the man. She completes the man. She complements the man. But it's not good for the man to be alone because he's got certain strengths, but he's got a, a lot of weaknesses too. And men, we realize, don't we, that our wives have a lot of the strengths we just don't have. They're sensitive when we're totally insensitive. <laughs> They appreciate beauty. A lot of times we just don't appreciate the beauty around us. My wife will look outdoors and she'll just go on and on about the flowers. I'm thinking, okay, you know, <laughs> I don't get it, but man, she just loves those flowers out there. And she and Judy will talk all morning long at breakfast about the beautiful flowers in our backyard. And it just goes right over my head. I, I just don't see the beauty and the glory in that flower. <laughs> but th that's a strength because they're able to appreciate things that us guys, we just, we just can't do. What would the world be like if you had men, a race of mankind, all of us men, men married to men, this would be a miserable place, wouldn't it? I, 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 <laughs> yeah, let's exit right now, right? <laughs> so, sometimes we, we think, gosh, this, this marriage is so difficult because we think so differently from each other. I just can't relate to this side of my wife, and she can't relate to me, and we have a hard time communicating. But actually, it's, it's a good thing that we have different strengths and different weaknesses, because her strengths complement my weaknesses, and my strengths complement her weaknesses. And together, we are a stronger unit than we would be apart. So she is a helper suitable or corresponding to her, complementing him. Now verse 19 says, Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whenever the man called a living creature, that was its name. Remember from chapter 1, God gave man the authority to exercise dominion over the creation, to rule over the creation. Well, here's the first act of his dominion. He's giving names to all of the different animals exercising his authority. And then verse 20 says, And the man gave names to all the cattle, and to the birds of the sky, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. What's God doing here? He's, he's parading all of the different animals before Adam and saying, Okay, Adam, give them all a name. <coughs> and so he says, Okay, I'm going to call this one Mr. and Mrs. Giraffe. Mr. and Mrs. Hippo, Mr. and Mrs. Orangutan. But as God brings all of these animals before Adam, he's noticing something. All these animals have a mate. All of them have a partner, a, one that completes them, a complement to them. I'm all alone. And he's developing in Adam a sense of need. Adam begins to realize, I need someone else, just like these animals have another partner that completes them, I need a counterpart for myself that will fit, that will correspond to me, that will be suitable to me. And because God intends to meet that need, first he stirs up the need within Adam's heart. So here we find Adam alone. Now let's look at Adam asleep. Verse 21. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of the ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. Here we have the very first surgery in the Bible. God himself is the surgeon, and he's the anesthesiologist. God puts him into this deep sleep. He opens up his side, and the Bible here says that he takes out a rib. 
that's probably not the, the best translation because the Hebrew word for rib is nowhere else translated as rib. It's usually translated side. And so probably a better rendering would be the Lord God fashioned into a woman the side that he had taken from the man. God opens up his side and he takes out some bone, but he also takes out some flesh. We know that from verse 23, because Adam says, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. So God takes out some flesh and bone from the side of Adam, and then he builds from that flesh and bone this woman. Actually, when it says here he fashioned the woman, <coughs> verse 22, the Lord God fashioned into a woman, the word literally is built. You can say Eve was very well built <laughs> because God is the one who directly built her. Can you imagine what Eve must have looked like? There's no sin in the world yet. And she was created like no other woman has ever been created. She was created directly from the hand of God, the master sculptor. There was no sin to mar anything that God had made. She must have been an extremely beautiful woman. So God builds her, and then the Bible says that he brings her to the man. So Adam didn't wake up from this divine surgery and look over and lying next to him is this woman. That's not the way it happened. Adam wakes up and he feels this weird sensation in his side and then he hears God saying, Adam, you forgot to name one of my creatures and here comes God bringing Eve to him and she's not wearing a wedding dress. She's buck naked. And you, I'm not making that up. Verse 25 says that the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So here comes God bringing a naked woman to the man. And at that time there was no shame in the world because there was no sin. And so this was completely ordinary and natural. So here God brings to the man the woman. Now, notice thirdly, Adam elated. Verse 23, the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. The Hebrew, we've really lost something in the translation from the Hebrew here. Some of the newer translations express it something like this. Finally! Or, at last, we might say, yes, <laughs> or right on, God. What this is really communicating is that God had brought all these various animals to Adam, and none of them were the right counterpart to him. None of them were suitable or corresponding to him. And when he wakes up and sees the woman, he says, finally, at last, God, this is the one. She matches me, and she compliments me perfectly. In fact, two German commentators, Kyle and Dalish, say there is a note of joyous astonishment in the Hebrew. He wakes up and he's joyously astonished. Lord, at last, here it is. There should be an exclamation mark at the end of the word uh, flesh. She's flesh of my flesh. And then it says, she shall be called woman. Now, Adam literally means man. She is man, but she shall be called wo-man. <laughs> In other words, the Hebrew for man is ish. You are ish, she shall be called ish sha. In other words, there's a play on words. She is just like me. She's not an orangutan. She's not an elephant. She's not a hippo. <laughs> I'm using all these pejorative words. I didn't mean to do that. She's not a, a beautiful cat. <laughs> but she's just like me. She's a woman. <laughs> Don't mind me today, guys. She's not a cougar. <laughs> a cougar? Okay. There we go. She shall be called woman, for she was taken from man. And in verse 24, there are three principles that are drawn from this verse. For this cause a man shall leave his father and his mother. So here's the idea of the priority of marriage. The priority of this relationship. Before this time, man has lived under his father's roof. Now he is to leave his father and his mother. This new relationship with his wife takes priority over the old relationship between him and his parents. 
In fact, if you're married, there is no other earthly relationship that is more important than your relationship to your spouse. We're called to leave our father and our mother. We're called to leave our brothers and sisters. This doesn't mean you have no relationship with them. It simply means it's not the priority of relationship in your life. Your priority is to your spouse. And then secondly, he says, and to cleave to his wife. Here's the permanence of marriage. The word cleave means to be glued to. If you're married, you're stuck to your spouse. You're glued to them. In fact, you ought to be. I read in those statistics I was talking about earlier that the average marriage today lasts about seven years. What a travesty. Seven years. We ought to have a whole generation of people that have been married to their spouse for 50 and 60 years. But how seldom do you find anybody who's been married to their spouse for that length of time? Permanence. The whole idea of permanence. Now, Jesus quotes from this verse in Matthew 19. I want to show you this. Matthew 19. He's talking to the, his disciples about the idea of divorce. He quotes verse 22 of Genesis 2 in 19.5. And then he says this. Consequently, they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. If you're married, you weren't just joined together by a justice of the peace or by a minister. If you're married, God has joined you to that other individual. A supernatural union has taken place. In the eyes of God, you are one flesh. And God says, let no man separate whom I have joined. That's how seriously the Bible speaks of divorce. Malachi 2 says that God hates it. He hates divorce. And if a couple ever wants me to, to give counseling to them before they're married, what I would want to do is to sit down with that couple and I'd want to look into the eyes of that young man and I'd like to tell him, let's imagine a scenario here. Let's imagine a couple of years into your marriage your wife is in an automobile accident, and she becomes a quadriplegic. She can never walk again. For the rest of your life, until you die, you are going to be her nurse. You're going to feed her. You're going to bathe her. You're going to clothe her. You're going to spend most of your life attending to her needs. Are you willing to go into a relationship knowing that is a possibility? There's not a trap door that you can just exit whenever you feel like it. You see, that's the kind of commitment God calls for every person when they say, I do. When they get married. You're committing yourself to that person alone, and you're saying, I am saying no to every other person in this world. And I'm saying yes to that one, till death do us part. So, the priority of marriage, it's above all other relationships. The permanence of marriage, we cleave to them, till death do us part. And then the pleasures of marriage. Jesus says that they become one flesh. And that's what we find here in Genesis chapter 2. And the two shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Over in 1 Corinthians 6.16, Paul is describing the situation where some of the Corinthians hypothetically could have had sex with a prostitute. And he says, if you do that, you become one flesh with her. And that's why it's such an evil thing to, to have sex outside of marriage. You are entering into a sexual one flesh relationship with that individual. So here in Genesis 2.24, when it says the two shall become one flesh, it's talking about a sexual union. But it's more than sexual. It's also emotional. It's also relational. There's a high degree of unity that develops when man and woman come together in marriage. So there is to be Priority, permanence, and pleasure all associated with marriage. <coughs> what do we learn then about marriage here in, in verse 24 and 25? We learn that marriage is between one man and one woman for one lifetime. That's God's ideal. Now I know it doesn't work out that way in our culture. Our culture has made it very, very easy to break the marriage bond and to get, to get a divorce. There's now no-fault divorces. When 
half of every marriage ends in divorce and it only lasts for seven years and we kind of expect going into a marriage, well, that might happen to us too. It's very, very easy to bail out when things get hard. But marriage is to be, be between one man, one woman for one lifetime. And sex outside of that marriage covenant relationship is sin against God. So it doesn't matter if you're committing fornication to people who are not yet married, entering into a sexual relationship, or people that are already married but having sex with people they're not married to, that's adultery, or whether it's a man and a man having sex, or a woman and a woman. That's why same-sex marriages don't make any sense, because God says, for this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife, not his husband. It's not two women joining together or two men joining together. God's plan is for a man and a woman to be joined together for one lifetime. I know that's not popular anymore, but that's how degraded our culture's begun. That, that we would have to defend something so natural and plain from the biblical account. But having said all of that, what I want to do is show you the glory and the beauty of Jesus Christ that is foreshadowed in the pages of Genesis chapter 2. And you say, well, Brian, why do you think that Jesus is to be seen in this passage? I think so because of something that the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5. I want you to look at that with me. In Ephesians 5, Paul's talking about marriage. And he comes down to the end of his discussion. And he says in verse 31, for this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. He's quoting from Genesis chapter 2, isn't he? And then he says, next verse, This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and his church. So in Genesis chapter 2, it's not just a situation with Adam and Eve. Paul sees behind the situation with Adam and Eve a greater spiritual reality. And the reality is that Adam foreshadows Christ and Eve foreshadows Christ's church. And so I want to show you some truths that emerge from Genesis chapter 2 about that. First of all, just as it was not good for Adam to be alone, it's not good for Jesus to be alone either. Do you know why it would not be good for Jesus to be alone without a bride? It's not because Jesus is lonely and he needs a church to fill his need. He's got the Father and the Spirit. That's all the fellowship he needs, right? There's no need within Jesus that needs to be filled by us. That, that's a horrible doctrine. That's completely man-centered and contrary to the whole uh, spirit of Scripture. The reason why Jesus, why it's not good for Jesus to be alone is because he can't put on display his glory without a bride. Romans chapter 8, verse 29 says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So, here's Jesus, the firstborn. First raised from the dead, never to die again. He's the firstborn from the dead. And he's the firstborn among many brethren that are all being conformed into his very image. He being the prototype... And all of these others are being conformed to that image of Christ. So Jesus dies for his bride, he rises for his bride, and he's able to put on display his attributes of love and mercy and grace and faithfulness and truth and justice. All of his attributes are put on display through the cross and redeeming a bride unto himself. And just as God was the one that arranged this first marriage, God is the one who arranges the second marriage. The Bible says in Ephesians 1 that God chose us in Christ from the, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. God set His love on us from eternity past. He chose and predestined that we would be the bride of His Son. And then He called us into fellowship with Jesus Christ, into a covenant marriage relationship with Jesus at the right time. Secondly, just as God put Adam to sleep to bring forth his bride from himself, 
So God put Christ into the sleep of death to bring forth from the wounds of Christ his own bride. Isaiah 53 says that the Lord was pleased to crush him. Now when we think about who put Jesus to death, we could have all kinds of answers to that, couldn't we? We could say the Jews put him to death because they're the ones that came to Pontius Pilate and said, this man has committed an act worthy of death. Or we could say it was the Romans that did it because they were the ones that actually nailed him to that cross and thrust the sword into his side. But if you take a step back, who's the one that really put Jesus to death? It was God. It was God who did that. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 23. Here's Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost. Pe uh, yeah, Peter says, This man, Jesus, delivered up by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men. So God predetermined and foreknew the cross. Over in chapter 4, we have the early church assembled for a prayer meeting. And they said, Truly in this city there were gathered together against thy holy servant Jesus, whom thou didst anoint, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever thy hand and thy purpose predestined to occur. So just as God was the one that put Adam to sleep, God was the one that put Christ to sleep to sleep. And just as Eve could not exist apart from something that God took from the side of Adam, the church could never exist apart from the wounds of Jesus. Jesus is put into the sleep of death. God brings forth from those wounds the church. If there's no Calvary, there is no church. Period. And then a third principle. Just as God brought the woman to Adam, God is going to bring the church to Christ. Sometimes we talk about, well, if a person's saved, can they be lost? My answer to that is no. If a person is truly saved, they cannot be lost because God is the one who is in charge of their sanctification. God is the one that's holding their hand and invisibly holding their hand and bringing that person all the way to meet with Jesus Christ in heaven one day. There's going to be all kinds of dangers, all kinds of temptations. I think of the book Pilgrim's Progress. Have you ever read that book? Great book. In that story, he's showing all of the, the dangers that Christian faces as he's making his way to the celestial city. But he makes it because God is the one that's bringing him invisibly. And God is bringing us invisibly to be with Jesus Christ in glory. Another principle, just as... The woman was created from the same substance as the man. We are recreated spiritually with the same Holy Spirit that is in Jesus. It's the Spirit of Christ who is now in you. And just as Adam and Eve shared the same nature, in 2 Peter 1.4 it says we are partakers of the divine nature. What that means is that when you're born again, God's nature is planted within your soul doesn't mean you become God. It means the nature of God becomes a part of who you are. You, you begin to think the things of God. You begin, to, uh, you begin to love the things of God. You begin to hate the things that God hates because His nature is in you. He's changed your heart. He's changed your inner person. And then again, we also learn that just as in the first marriage... Adam was to be the head of the relationship and the wife was to submit to him. That's exactly what we find in Ephesians chapter 5 when Paul talks about Christ and his church. Let's just read that together. Ephesians 5 verse 22. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. You find the very same thing taking place. Just as Adam was to be the head of Eve, 
Christ is to be the head of his bride, the church. And so if you and I are unwilling to submit to Jesus Christ, we can't be his bride. The bride is subject to her husband, just as the church is subject to Christ. And then again, just as Adam was to never divorce Eve, he was never to be separated, he was to cleave to her for the rest of his life, Christ is never going to divorce his bride. Those he has brought into this new covenant, he will never divorce, he will never cast off. Second. Timothy 2.13 says, if we are faithless, he remains what? He remains faithful because he can't deny himself. He would have to deny himself to be faithless towards us. And folks, we are faithless, aren't we? Have you perfectly been faithful to Jesus since you became a Christian? Of course you haven't. I haven't. No one here has. No one in this world has. We have all at times committed spiritual adultery. We have been faithless, but he has been, remained faithful and he will remain faithful to continue to draw us, to bring us all the way into glory to be with Jesus forever. And just as Adam was so excited and elated when he saw his bride that was brought to him, there's coming a day when Jesus Christ is going to joyfully receive his bride. In Revelation 19, it says that the bride has made herself ready for the marriage of the supper of the Lamb has come. Now, what kind of occasions are feasts and marriages? They're joyous, right? People are happy and excited. It's a time of celebration. Jesus is going to joyfully receive his church at the marriage supper of the Lamb. He's going to say to us, well done. Thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master. He's going to say, come you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And then we, the righteous, are going to shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. It's going to be a time of great joy, a great reunion, physical face-to-face -face reunion with Jesus Christ. And so, this morning, for those of you who are Christians, and I don't know how many of you are Christians and who are not, God alone knows that, but if you are in covenant relationship to Him, my word to you this morning is, be faithful to Him. He is your husband. James chapter 4 talks a lot about this. He says that when we love the world, we become adulteresses, spiritual adulteresses. And the Holy Spirit within us is yearning, jealously desiring that Christ has our affection in our hearts, that we are living for Him rather than the things of the world. And so, those of you who are Christians, I want to call you back to a life of faithfulness to Christ. If there are idols that are encroaching within your heart where you're starting to love and give yourself to these things, we need to repent. And maybe the Holy Spirit is identifying some idols within your heart today. These things have become more alluring, more captivating, more beautiful than Jesus. You need to repent of those things this morning. Jesus is worthy of your heart's affection and your desire. And if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ today, why aren't you? His arms are open wide and he's saying, if you will have me, I'll be married to you. I offer you myself. I offer you my cross. I offer you my grace. And so it's as though we're standing at the altar and the minister says, will you take Jesus to be your lawfully wedded husband? And all it requires of you is to say, I do. I will. I give myself in covenant relationship to Jesus. And so if you're not a Christian this morning, give yourself heart and soul to him today. That's really as, as simple as it is. Be willing to be married to this one. And he's willing this morning to be married to you. Father, we just pray in Jesus' name today that you would seal these truths to the hearts of your people. We pray, Lord, for the Spirit of God to root out our allurements to the world and find Jesus to be altogether lovely. That he would be our all in all. 
And Lord, if any are here today, apart from a saving relationship to Jesus Christ, would you open up their hearts, make them willing in the day of your power, may they surrender themselves right now, and receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord and King and treasure. We pray in your holy name. Amen.